I'm going to work in this video problem 2.8 from Classical Mechanics with MATLAB Applications. This problem gives us a velocity dependent force, telling us that we have an object with mass m, veloc initial velocity v0, and a force negative c v squared. So that is clearly a velocity dependent force, and asks us to find velocity as a function of time. Well, your book gives a handy-dandy equation coming from the definition of force that says if we have a velocity-dependent force, we can calculate time with this equation. By integrating over velocity. Yeah, that's a V there at the bottom. And this is equation 2.52 in your book, and that just comes from uh, the fact that velocity is mass times acceleration. So all I have to do here is plug in the force I was given and perform the integral. So here I have plugged in variables, uh, basically just the force equation. And the signs there indicate that this thing is falling, and the air resistance or the velocity dependent force is going to resist motion. So if the thing is falling, the velocity dependent force should resist that falling or be pointing up. This equation is in the form of a known integral that looks like the integral du over a squared minus u squared, and that integral turns out to be 1 over a hyperbolic tangent of inverse hyperbolic tangent, and then the argument of that hyperbolic tangent is u over a. So I can rearrange this equation just a little bit to make it look like that. Here I've rearranged the equation to make it look like the form of the known integral. And if you need to copy anything down from this page, I'm going to have to flip to a new one, so do that now. Let me pause the video if you need to copy anything. I've performed the integral using that equation, and this is a bit intimidating because the u and a from that uh, form of the integral turned out to be multiple variables all in one. And this is what I get if I perform the integral using uh, the form I showed you on the last page. And then with some algebra that is um, tedious but straightforward, you can arrive at the equation for v. And if I rearrange for v, this is what I get. Um, just a couple notes, because I was having trouble with my space here. That is a, a t right there. But take a look at that. You can see that uh, I just rearranged and did a, a tanch to get rid of the one inverse tangent around v. And that was it, all just algebra from that point. All right, now we're going to go on to part B, which says the object is now going up. So this was something falling, and next we're going to have an object going up. Since the object is going up, both gravity and our velocity-dependent force, that friction or air resistance or what have you, will be both resisting motion. So the object is traveling up, and these things are both shoving it down. And then we just fill in to, again, equation 2.5.2 from your book. So I have simply filled in the force there. And again, I'm going to rearrange that so that it looks like that same integral formula that I used earlier. So notice I have just arranged that equation, uh, negative m over c, integral of dv over mg over c plus v squared. And now it is of the same formula that results in inverse tangent. So if I carry out that integral, notice some things I was doing this. This is actually a slightly different integral. So let's make another little note down here, and I'll tell you about this integral. Uh, this actually results in a, a tangent, not hyperbolic tangent. So an integral du of, and the difference here is the sign in front of the u, a squared plus u squared, 
making sure I'm doing this right since I messed up, uh, is 1 over a regular tangent u over a. So same form, but there's a plus now, and that changes it from a hyperbolic tangent to a tangent. Now if I carry out that correct integral, here is my result. Um, again, you're basically just substituting into this thing over here. And I can, with algebra, simplify that and get v. I'm going to do that on the next page, so if you need to copy anything, do that real fast. That equation got messy fast, so I made two substitutions. Let me draw your attention to these first. I called tau square root of m over cg. And uh, this is going for like a new t, but ended up just looking like a v. So vt square root mg over c. And then this was the result when I solved for v. So that is for the object going up. Next we'll do the object. Uh, let's see what the book says. The next part is... Do, 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 do. dropped from rest. So we're going to have the object drop from rest and then we're supposed to compare it to when it is thrown up with some v naught. So I think that is just comparing to part A it looks like. So it turns out that uh, is a hint that if we go back and look at our answer to part A and just put in that v naught was zero, this is the velocity we find. And the book says, now compare this to our previous result. Well, that was kind of how we found the answer. It also says find an expression for position. So now we need the position. So, oh, oops. Now our velocity is time dependent, so this is now an integral in the kinematics equation. So v t, using that uh, substitution I showed you earlier, integral 0 to t, tanch. It's all integrated with respect to t. So you have to go look it up, but it turns out that integral is basically a hyperbolic cosine, and the equation turns into. So we carry out that integral. Um, this is our result, just a couple of clarifying things. So we have m over cg vt, which remember from my earlier substitution is the square root of m of g over c natural log cosh of, and then the argument of cosh, square root cg over m times t. Now that was just something you go look up. Um, you recognize that tanch looks like is cinch over cosh, and then there's an integral of for that. You just had to go look up that, that integral. So next I'll move to part d, and in part d, It asks, what is the position as a function of time? The question's a little ambiguous. It must mean now for the object going up. So we have the object going down. Now we have the object going up with some initial velocity. So I'll start a new page for that. Now to prevent this from getting overwhelming, we're basically going to do substitutions within substitutions. So I went back to our answer from problem A where we figured out what the velocity was, and it had a, a tanch and an inverse tanch in it. And now I've made these substitutions. So we've got a in there, tau, and vt. Okay, so now we can write down our equation for position. So here's our position expression. Again, this is just basic kinematics, realizing that the velocity is um, not constant, and so we're taking our velocity part as an integral. 
And this is another one that you have to go look up. So tan of u du. Turns out that's a negative log of a cosine. And if we look that up and fill in what I get from the integral table, here's the result of my integral where I haven't filled in the limits. If you need to copy anything down, pause and do that real fast. And then here is our final position equation, which was a, a bear to write down. And really, formally, you should probably plug back in all of the uh, substitutions we made, but this is much cleaner, much simpler, so I'm going to leave it like this. You can do that on homeworks as long as you're very clear about your substitutions. So if this were a homework, I would want to add a note to the TA grading once again, even though I'd said it before, just make their life easy. And so I have written down what those things are just to make it easier for someone troubleshooting my work. All right, two more to go. Next up, I want how long it takes to reach the maximum height. This is, again, assuming the thing is going up. So I'll do that on the next page. If we've reached our maximum height, that implies our velocity is 0. So what I did was I took the velocity equation we found earlier for this thing going up and wrote down... Uh, what that means here. So just that it's zero. And now what I can do is solve that for t to get the time it takes me to reach the top. And that's it. That's exactly what you would have done in 113 or 114. Once we have our velocity, if we're looking for the time at the top, we just say, okay, what's the time when velocity equals zero? And we found our time to the maximum height. The next question says, what is the actual maximum height reach? So I have my time, now I want the position. I'll start part F, that is, on the next page. In part D, we found our position as a function of time, shown here. And then in part E, which we just did, we found our time to the top, shown here. And so now I'm just left to fill in my position. And there is a x naught missing from here, so this should say x naught plus. And now I'm just filling in my time into that position equation. And there we go. Now if you wanted to, you could go back and replace all of our substitutions, and this thing gets pretty messy. Um, I can write down for you my final result when I simplify this. Uh, so you can compare. So if you write in all of our substitutions, you get something that looks like... And I was lying a little bit there. It looks like I didn't even do it with all the substitutions. I just replaced what A is. All right, there were a lot of variables there. Made several handy substitutions to help us along the way, which is a nice physics problem-solving trick. If you notice that some constant uh, thing is coming up over and over and over again, just go ahead and make it uh, one variable. If you notice a combination of constants keeps coming up because otherwise the equations just get unwieldy and you can't notice patterns or notice that they're actually really simple equations. Sometimes you'll realize something is just an equation you already know or a form of an equation you already know or an integral you already know how to solve. But if you have all these messy constants running around, they're very distracting.